Hello folks, what's the crack? Hugh James here. I hope you're doing really well and welcome to Mental Health, the podcast where we discuss the latest tools, cutting edge research and ancient practices to help you take back control of your emotional well-being. Today's episode is the second half of our ADHD 101 special, where we are in the process of diving deep into the causes, treatments and potential superpowers around this specific disorder. If you haven't checked out last week's episode, I'd highly, highly recommend going back and listening to that one because it sets the context for everything that we talk about today, which is really more of the practical side to managing the negative aspects of attention deficit disorders while learning from a scientific perspective. Thank you for flipping Steve. How all of us can supercharge our focus and reclaim our attention in this kind of frenetic, crazy digital world that we find ourselves in. So yeah, thanks so much for being here. Time to welcome back to your ears the wonderful Dr. Alardi, who is midstream, mid-flow, as we mentioned in the last episode, of sharing some really, really useful content that blew my mind and hope blows your mind around the topic of ADHD. Let's go. Well, I mean, this leads us very nicely into my favorite part of the conversation, which is what the heck can we actually do? We need like a little jingle music for that <laughs> that little segment. <laughs> also, when you said Omega yeah. 3 earlier, I was like, Omega 3 needs to have its own theme song on this show. You know, every time Absolutely. we mention it, every episode, it needs to have like some sort of like superhero little da 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 da. <laughs> you know, if we weren't such a uh, mental health themed podcast, you could imagine some listeners creating a drinking game or something. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe a it, shot of fish oil should, every time Omega Three is mentioned. <laughs> it, I, it, exactly right. Although maybe maybe we better leave this part out because uh, we don't want anybody overdosing on you know. The, not that it would 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 really harm anyone, but they they might. Um, how to put this? They might need to keep a bathroom close at hand for the next uh, day or two if they took too much fish oil. Good to okay. know. Good to yeah. know. So look, the yeah. treatments, the tools, like we said at the top of the show, the ancient practices, whatever gets it done. Yeah to help with ADHD. Yeah. Do you maybe want to cover the drugs first? Let's talk about drugs. Let's do it. So, you know, people who follow my work, people who know me, know that I'm pretty skeptical about a lot of the the, the hype, the claims of miracle drugness around most of our psychotropic meds, because I'm, I'm a researcher. I, I am deeply immersed in in the actual treatment research literature. And usually when you take a dive into that literature, you come away shaking your head saying, man, these drugs are not living up to the hype. And we'll unpack that claim at all kinds of level of detail later on, because I I don't want people just to take my word for it. And we'll have all kinds of links in show notes. But for now, let me just say this. Clinically speaking, I have seen more miraculous responses to stimulant meds for ADHD than I have personally seen to any other class of meds for any other diagnostic condition. So So this is one where the the drugs can potentially make a significant impact for a significant number of people. Exactly right. And I love the way you put that because another mantra, you know, time to take a shot of fish oil, there is no one size fits all solution. And it turns out that some people respond to stimulant meds in a very unfavorable way. Not only do they not get any benefit, but they get side effects, they get insomnia, they get anxiety, they get panic attacks, you know, it's so for them, it's not a not a good thing, not a positive at all. But for basically two thirds of the people with with diagnostic level ADHD who take a stimulant, what are we talking about? Adderall, Ritalin, Vyvanse, Concerta, and and these are very familiar meds to American audiences, at least. We could also talk about the generic chemical names, methylphenidate, mixed amphetamine salts, and so forth. These drugs provide pretty substantial benefit for ADHD symptoms for about two-thirds of the people who take them, at least in the short term. And that's the big disclaimer, the big caveat that I've got to give why... Because the longest study that's ever been done on stimulant meds for ADHD, it's called the, if it, it, we'll put it in the show notes, it's called the MTA, the Multimodal Treatment of ADHD Study. It involved about 580 kids, started tracking them around age eight, and they're randomly assigned to get stimulant or 
psychotherapy or both or neither or nothing. And they were then tracked for the next 20 plus years. So an amazing, amazing study design, very ambitious. And what they found was when they brought the kids back 14 months into the study, the ones who were, who were on the Ritalin were doing a lot better on average than the kids who got nothing, than better than they had been doing before they got the Ritalin. And that was uh, through their parent ratings, through the teacher ratings, through their own self-report ratings. Every metric said 14 months in, yeah, the drugs are really helping. Guess what? These kids were generally taking their meds every day. That, that was the standard instruction back then. Well, the problem is for most meds, if we present them to the brain every day, the brain is going to push back. The brain is going to adapt. For some meds, for some and some other recreational things we would use like caffeine, the brain will adapt way faster than 14 months. The brain might adapt in a month or two, mm. uh, for example, for some of our anxiety meds, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. But for stimulant meds, for ADHD at least, 14 months out, they were still getting really great benefit. But at three years out, they were getting none. Wow. So at the three-year follow-up, so now most of these kids are about 11, the ones who had stimulant, they're doing absolutely no better than they were at baseline on average. They're doing no better than the kids who were getting the therapy. And they're really not doing better than the kids who got nothing. And the really shocking thing is when these kids were now followed up in high school and then post high school, there was no measurable benefit for having been on the stimulant. And the only real effect that they could, could tell who was on the stimulant and who wasn't is the kids who were on the stimulant were about one inch shorter What on average because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the stimulant can be an appetite suppressant and we don't really want to suppress appetite during childhood while the body is, is, is in its major growth plate spurts. And so, yeah, it turned out it had a little bit of an impact on, on physical stature, which is not awesome. Now, I don't want to alarm listeners, but what I would say is, and I'm not a prescriber, my wife is, but what I can tell you, and I work with a lot of prescribers, the most savvy stimulant prescribers are now telling their patients, even though you're tempted to take this every day, we don't want your brain to fully get used to this medication. We don't want it to push back and adapt. And so how about this? Can you try only taking it five or six days a week? Or if you take it all seven days a week, can you try taking a vacation? Maybe if you're a student, maybe in the summer, maybe during a long break where it's a month or so, uh, a couple times a year where your brain has a chance to reset all of its dopamine receptors mm. back down to baseline so you continue getting this nice benefit so that when we measure you three years out, we don't find that, that you're no longer getting any benefit at all. Or, God forbid, that we're having to ramp up the dose into the stratosphere to the point where it's giving you horrible insomnia, horrible lack of appetite, horrible anxiety, you know, some of the side effects that we see with much higher doses of these stimulants. So they're a mixed bag, but I believe they're an incredibly valuable tool in the toolkit for some people with ADHD. We absolutely want to validate that. Okay. No, that makes total sense. I'm glad I asked and I'm glad you laid it up like that. So drugs aside, would also be a good title for your next book. <laughs> Drugs aside. <laughs> you know, uh, treatment to mental health disorders that don't involve big pharma. What other tools do we have here at our disposal? What sort of things do you see in your clinical research and your practice that really moves the needle for people? Yeah, well, some of them we, we've already talked about in other contexts because they're so ridiculously powerful in affecting the brain. So exercise... And, and, and especially high intensity movement, whether it's cardio or strength training, weightlifting, whatever, high intensity movement profoundly stimulates the dopamine circuits that we need to get more active in ADHD, both in the midbrain where we have the reward circuitry, also in the prefrontal cortex, as we've talked about quite a bit. So exercise is a drug. And is enormously beneficial, as I've mentioned and shared, maybe a little TMI, but that's all right. I have some subsyndromal 
symptoms. And if I exercise vigorously in the morning, actually, it doesn't matter what time of day, I can count on a heroic level of focus probably for the next four to six hours afterwards. So yeah, exercise, absolutely. Everybody with ADHD, if they are physically able, talk to their doctor, talk to their healthcare professional, but they, they really need to be moving a lot. Our bodies are designed to be moving a lot. It, it is a wonder drug. It's not curative for most people with ADHD, but it's, it, it, it improves things. This is really interesting. I'm just going to jump in. Anecdotally, yeah. I have accidentally fallen into the rhythm of doing my high intensity workouts first thing in the morning. The reason why is because I noticed it made a big difference to my writing sessions, which is the first yeah. part of my workday. So absolutely, I, let's just say, will do a routine of some sort at seven o'clock with the intention of getting into the writing desk at eight o'clock. And then I write for 90 minutes. I mean, the, the time doesn't matter. I have noticed that whenever I exercise beforehand, that session goes so much more smoother it's cleaner, the flow just comes a lot faster, and I'm not banging my head against the wall as much. So it's interesting, even anecdotally, I've experienced what you've just said. Absolutely. I've even noticed that when I do a, a, a later exercise, so let's say, you know, it, it happens for me sometimes after a long day on campus, I'll get home and I'll do my workout, say, from six to seven, which is what I'm going to do it tonight that I will be sharper in the classroom the next day following an intense workout than I would be if I, if I skipped the workout. So there, there are carryover effects. I think a lot of them are immediate, but, but yeah, I've even noticed that. Yeah. Uh, So now let me, let me say, um, let me talk about another uh, set of, no, that's great. I'm literally just going to jump in. Yeah, go ahead. So I don't do caffeine anymore. I've been caffeine free for probably about three years for various Dude, reasons you are so countercultural. Ah! I'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure we can hang out anymore because <laughs> i i now now i'm feeling a little threatened um oh, I, do you, I do you feel the resistance of, do you feel the judgment creep I, up inside you man? i am i am part of the great unwashed masses who <laughs> ingest caffeine as a go-to stimulant every single day it's over 90 percent of the well adult i mean population. You, you know all about the enlightenment and how you know it was pretty much caused whenever they switched from beer to coffee so you know you can you can lean on that crutch if it helps you <laughs> the, the, i i'm i am a big proponent of the hypothesis that the industrial revolution could could not indeed would not have occurred had it not been for the ministrations of daily hot caffeinated beverage yep, to the workforce so here's the picture okay i write in the morning let's say it brings me to lunchtime and then i podcast in the afternoon i often will do a podcast at 12 and i also often will do a podcast at three i've noticed that in between my first podcast and my second podcast i need a little something something and i can't reach for a cup yeah. of coffee so i need to reach for something else so what i've been doing and i literally did it yesterday i had a podcast went on for two hours it set the rest of my schedule completely on fire And I had half an hour before my next one, which is not an ideal scenario. So I went out to my car, I put my running shoes on, and I went for a 15-minute run. And I've started to do that as a cup of coffee because I noticed that I come back into the last part of my workday totally energized, totally focused, totally ready to go. And I like that example because it's a little micro dose of the drug yeah. you referred to love as it. exercise. I there you go. It. This is my no, TED Talk. My name is Hugh James. Thanks for being here. Uh, Hugh, thank you for, for, for this wonderful TED Talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Microdosing intensive uh, exercise is, is music to my ears, and I, I hope it's an inspiration to, to, to many of us. All right. So now let me pivot back to something I, I probably should have said as soon as you ask the question, like, what else do we have in our toolkit? Well, a lot of the people who have ADHD and they've been living with it for years. I see these kids all the time, by the way, Hugh, at the university level where I lecture on ADHD and they feel seen, they feel heard. They've never been diagnosed. They come to my office hours. We have a really heart to heart. A lot of times there are tears involved. Usually there, sometimes uh, both of ours and they get into treatment. Often the treatment, not always, but often involves medication. And even if they have a life changing experience, which they sometimes do, they find that there are still basic skills that they've never learned. 
that they have to learn, like how to make a to-do list and how to keep it, how to make a calendar, how to schedule things because they're always missing appointments, they're missing deadlines, how to take a big project like a, a major paper or some other project and break it down into all the little tiny sequential tasks that most people learn how to do along the way. They've never learned it. And so behavior therapy, just skills-based behavior therapy is often a really important piece for people that have missed out on those basic skills along the way. So absolutely, that, that's another tool. I'm going to jump in here with a, a practical tool to follow that up. This is a non-sponsored, no financial relationship, just a fanboy relationship here. I've been using this thing the last few years called the Full Focus Planner. Okay, I didn't plan on saying oh, that today, okay. but there you go. It ties in nicely. Full Focus yeah, and it's it's by a guy called Michael Hyatt, and he's kind of built out this suite of products. He's all like into productivity. And basically what it is, is it's a daily planner that has laid out very beautifully on your page. And you can totally steal this and use it on your, you know, your $1 notebook or whatever. The daily three. So the three most important tasks that you want to get done for the day. So this is like, if all else fails, these are the things that you want to tick off your list. Forget the, the 100 uh, bullet point to-do list. You're going to have three things in your day that you're going to do. And sometimes they're not all work-related. You know, it could just maybe be one of the points could be have such and such over for dinner, you know. So it's three things. Focus on that. It has a little kind of time block to the right of it where it's like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and so on. So you can sketch out at the start of your day what you're going to spend each hour doing, a.k.a. a rough schedule that you can tweak and change along the way there's also lots of space for notes and the big to-do list if you want to throw it in there if you do have a day where there's lots of kind of small little tasks you need to get done but what i love about it is it's a quarterly planner so at the start of the planner you open it up and you plan out the big tasks you want to get done for the quarter then each week you also have the chance to plan out your week and set your intentions for what you want to do. And then, like I say, you've got the daily play-by-play version of that. And I like that because it keeps me focused on not only what I'm doing each day, but how each day connects to like the bigger metric of the week, the month, and then the quarter. And it's a great way to kind of build review into your practice, yeah. see what's working, see what's not working. And I just like that it's all done for me. I you know, I wake up and it's all just there and I just need to fill it in. And so I found that tool to be very useful and helpful. Yeah, this is outstanding. This is, this is exactly the sort of tool that really just takes a lot of the principles of behavior therapy that we talked about that are evidence-based, that have been shown to be helpful. And it just distills it all in one place, something that people can use on their own. It's not going to cost a lot of money. Love it. So the other thing that I would kind of throw in at this point is Two books, if you're looking for a jumping off point, and they're not ADHD specific, but they are kind of focus orientated, and it's the work of an incredible guy, also a professor, his name's Cal Newport, and both of these books came into my life at two totally different times, and they have been hugely influential in the way that I kind of organize my professional life and even my daily schedule. So the first one is called Deep Work. And its whole kind of thesis is if you want to thrive in the knowledge economy, if you want to be really successful, the number one thing you have to do is to develop the ability to focus. And he actually calls like attention the most valuable asset that we have in this new kind of emerging economy going forward where we're on our laptops, we're doing our thing, whatever our skill is, whether it's writing or podcasting, we all need the ability to have significant portions of our workday where it's us in the weeds doing the work away from distractions because that's where true value is created so it's awesome if for as a jumping off point if you want to learn more digital minimalism is another fantastic book by him and we'll have uh, links to this in the show notes and it basically helps you create a better relationship with the technology in your life whether it's email whether it's social media whether it's your smartphone whether it's just your devices that you have lying around the house and his whole thing is make sure that you're using these tools and that they are not using you and i just think that they're so so valuable to help us set better boundaries with some of the hugely powerful powers of distraction that we're up against in our day-to-day lives. You know, I don't need to talk about yeah, social media. Great. I don't need to talk about the social dilemma. We're all on the same page here. We know what's going on. 
These are huge companies that have invested a lot into the psychology of the human mind to try to make their products more powerful. And so uh, two great jumping off points to explore. Yeah, let me just jump in here for a second. I, I Just on the digital minimalism point. So I got to share a really quick story. So most of us know that the first iPhone, the first smart, really widespread smartphone was introduced in 2007. A year later, fall of 2008, I was teaching about ADHD. I had a student, very bright student, come up uh, right after the lecture. And he said, Dr. Lardy, is it possible that an iPhone could cause somebody to develop ADHD? Whoa. And and I, I was intrigued. I said, well, um, we don't know because they've only been out for a year. <laughs> but tell me, tell, tell me more. And he said, okay, I am a... Graduating senior this year, I came into last semester with a 3.8 GPA. In other words, almost a straight A average. And I got my iPhone and pretty soon I really felt like I was addicted to it. Like it was just, I had to be on it all the time. And when I was supposed to be having that deep focus, that deep work, anything really throughout my day that required lots of attention, I would get this huge feeling of jitteriness, this temptation of like, I got to check my phone. Did somebody text? Is there something going on? My social media, whatever. And he's like, by the end of the semester, I found not only did my grades suffer, but my ability just to stay locked in had really, really gone in the toilet. And he said, now this semester, after a full summer of using this iPhone, hours a day, I, I find I can't focus at all. Wow. And I'm really worried about it. And he's like, I just want to put this on your radar because I think it's a thing. And I think that we're going to find that this could be a real problem for some people. So wow. um, that is course, like that was, prophetic, dude. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it was it was highly prophetic. And I've never forgotten that conversation. Well, that's useful because I find in my own life that focus is a little bit like a muscle. Like it's something that can get yep. stronger and weaker uh, depending on some of the actions that you take, depending on the season. And for anyone who hasn't checked it out, I really encourage you to go back and listen to our conversation with Dr. Anna Lemke. She has a really useful paradigm that's helped me a lot in the realm of dopamine to try to figure out in your mind and to try to understand what's actually happening here with the constant what's the best way to put this, like ratcheting up of your ability to be distracted and also how you can slowly start to kind of untangle that process and become a little more focused and a little more uh, resilient. She talks a lot about it from the perspective of addiction, but I think there's a lot of really interesting crossover in light of what Steve has said today, all about dopamine as well. But for me, again, a little bit like exercise, something that I've noticed is with my writing sessions, if I check email before i write it's pretty much game over <laughs> <laughs> like no kidding yeah when i when i wake up and i'm in that kind of nice morning state you know mine's a little bit quiet i do my exercise and i come in and i i do the 90 minutes it really I, it just works for me but if i decide oh let me check my email or let me check my messages or let me fire up whatsapp i find it so hard to get into that state of deep focus to the point where I've literally just said, okay, I'm not going to check this stuff until I'm finished my writing for the day. And that's one of my big three every single day, pretty much to the day I die now on that planner is first, first block writing. And as soon as it's done, it's tick. And then I can engage with the digital world. Then I can engage with some of the frenetic nature of life that let's be honest, we all have to engage with. There's no way you can get around it unless you, you know, throw all your screens in the river and you become a monk, which is still probably maybe what I'll end up doing whenever I'm older. Who knows? Uh, I, I, I'm like, <laughs> I wonder I wonder if your wife would have anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife and like all the podcasts I'm involved in, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting dialectic tension that I find myself in. Um, dopamine fasting is an interesting 
interesting concept Lemke talks about as well, this idea of reducing our inputs and re- reducing our distractions and how this can actually help increase our focus, yes, in the day-to-day, but also over a longer period of time. It's pretty much the opposite of the iPhone story that you shared, how this individual exactly. slowly yeah. spiral down the staircase as such. You can also slowly spiral upwards. And I think that it's, it's really important that we kind of keep coming back to that. Can I just jump in with a little practical neuroscience on that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so the dopamine reward system in the brain, it it doesn't work like most people think it does. So it's not it's not like it just sits there neutrally and is it's just judging like how pleasurable is this? How rewarding is this? And and I'll fire exactly at the level of how pleasurable or how rewarding. Instead, what it does is it sits there and it makes predictions all day long. What's going to happen? How rewarding is it? And if whatever happens is better than expected or better than what has been happening, then it like sits up and pays attention. It's like, oh, we got to have a, a, a big surge of dopamine to bookmark this, to flag it and say, this was better than we expected. So, so let's make sure we remember it and update all of our expectations in the future. Okay. Because the brain is constantly predicting. So If I start my day on social media and maybe with email, I, you know, I'm, I'm engaged with a device, with a screen that's giving me all these little surges of reward, all that's designed to capture my attention. So that's engaging, it's stimulating, it's rewarding. And then I pivot to deep focus work. Well, the deep focus work is hard. It, it, it's, it's challenging. Now it is rewarding, but it's rewarding in the way that something very profound and deeply meaningful is rewarding. It's like a slower burn, isn't it? Exactly. So the, the, the sort of empty calorie reward of interacting with a screen is kind of like if you're trying to start a fire and you just have some little uh, dry leaves or twigs or pieces of paper kindling. And you light it and, it and it and it catches fire immediately, but it's not going to keep you very warm. It's going to be very showy and then it's over. Mm. And if you want to keep it going, oh, this is actually a pretty good, good analogy, right? If you want to keep it going, you got to throw more on it. And that's what our phones are doing with us all the time. It's like, I need more. I need more. I need it again and again and again. As opposed to if you, if you are starting a fire and you've got this massive log, it's going to take a lot of work to get that thing burning. But once it starts burning, then it's way more robust, way longer lasting, way more fulfilling, way more powerful. And so a lot of our best efforts. The slow burn. Oh my goodness. That is so beautifully put. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Well, you you gave me the idea, but but yeah, I I was happy to roll with it. So yeah, I I really think that that's a, a, it's, it's a really, really compelling image of the difference between those little dopaminergic hits that we get from our devices versus that slow, robust burn that we get from deep focus. You ever been bowling? (laughs) It's a leading question. (laughs) American bowling? Yes. What do you mean? Like 10 pin bowling? Like in a bowling alley? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, ten pin bowling. Not, okay. not like the the. Yeah, so go ahead. The senior citizen pastime is that what you're going to say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude, I when I was ten years old, I was in a bowling league. I will have you know, bro, uh, like the old people's bowling. Like the except it was for young people back in the day because back in the day, I mean, you know, we're all old now, but we bowled. That was a thing. We were not bowling alone, if for those who know the title of that landmark yeah, so sociological little, little text. little callback we from a previous episode there yeah, for the long-time e- listeners. E- so, exactly. So, 10-pin bowling, right? You know, now you go as a kid and they put the, I can't remember what they call them, the gates up, like the little boundary Yeah, oh, things. yeah, yeah. We call them the gutter guards. Gutter guards. Gutter boundaries. Love yeah. a wee double G alliteration. It's hard to beat. Yeah. So... Sometimes when we make changes in our life, I think it's it's helpful to have a bit of a gutter guard to help us out, like almost like a handrail, something to hold on to, something to keep the, I'll, I'll not mix metaphors here, something to keep the bowling ball on the straight and narrow in case we maybe misfire every now and then. And there's a wonderful little piece of free software, again, no affiliation with them, uh, called Block Site. 
block as in blocked and reported, site as in the end of website. And it has some really, really, really powerful tools that I use in my, my daily life. So first of all, they have like just a block list. So you can upload or you can type in and select like websites that you just categorically do not want to be on. So for me, this is how I kicked YouTube and Reddit, which are probably the most powerful drugs on the planet, in my opinion. Uh, and I just, mm-hmm. I, I made a commitment. Yep. Look, I'm not going to, I don't want to be on these sites anymore. They take so much of my time. They distract me, blah, 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 blah. And I just threw them on the block list. And what it does is it removes your ability to go on it on your desktop and on your mobile. So it's pretty robust. It does a really good job. You also can do this thing called focus mode where you hop on, you set a timer and you click start. And it will only allow you to access the websites that you've put on your whitelist during the focus mode. So it's effectively nice. a way to help you get engaged in your deep work. So when I'm writing in the morning, I come in, I open up block, block site. It's a Chrome extension. I click start session and I don't have the ability to check my email during that session. And that just, you know, I'm a big power in making life easy for yourself and not having to use every ounce of willpower you have in every single living second. And that's just a really, really useful tool that outsources my willpower to technology and allows me to stay focused. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, it's it's like o- Odysseus, you know, um, when when he's sailing close to the the island with the siren song, right? The siren have have the song that's so haunting and irresistible that every sailor who ever hears it is irresistibly drawn uh, uh, to their death because they're, they're going to uh, they're going to steer the ship straight toward it right into the rocks and crash and drown and die and Odysseus really wants to hear the song but he knows that he can't so he outsources his willpower to his shipmates and says Tie me to the mast. Whatever I say, whatever I do, don't unleash me. Cover your ears, but leave mine uncovered. I want to be able to sail right up to the edge of destruction and live to tell the tale. And so you're saying when we're working, maybe we can outsource willpower, not to our shipmates, but to this lovely website called Blocksite. (laughs) I love it, dude. Anything else, Steve, as a jumping off point that you'd like to leave with people in terms of treatments? Absolutely. So there's some low hanging fruit. We've sort of gestured at it already. Um, First is we really will do better with focus if we clean up our diet. And what I mean by that primarily is just get out of our diet. The vast majority of foods that come in a box or a can that have unpronounceable ingredients, because as we've seen, those additives, those um, uh, food colorings and dyes and chemicals, they can actually cross into the brain of anyone and cause them temporarily to lose focus and maybe even to feel physically agitated and somewhat hyperkinetic. Secondly, there are nutrients that we need. I mentioned this earlier, zinc. We've got to be careful with zinc supplementation. Talk to your healthcare provider why. You need zinc, and a lot of people are deficient, but it also interferes with the absorption of iron. So people, if they supplement too much zinc for too long, they can get anemic. It also interferes with the absorption of copper. Again, copper anemia is a thing. It's, it's bad news. Wow. You don't want it. Every day is a school day. Interesting. Yeah. So if you're supplementing with zinc, and by the way, you can do this naturally with whole foods. How, you may ask? Well, tree nuts, regular nuts, not peanuts, but tree nuts are often a really good dietary source of zinc. So are, if you're not of the faint of heart, like I am, if you're willing to eat like liver, uh, <laughs> organ meats, they, they're really, really rich in trace minerals like zinc. And then omega-3s, we've talked about quite a bit already on the pod. So from fish oil or from plant sources like flax seed or hemp seed like that. And then Two, two other things I should mention really quickly. One, meditation. Mm. It doesn't have to be mindfulness meditation. It can be, it can be uh, mantra-based. It can be uh, movement-based, like Tai Chi. Any kind of meditative practice actually enhances the function of our prefrontal attentional circuitry. So can be enormously beneficial. The irony is that many of us who are on the ADHD spectrum have incredible difficulty with sitting still meditation, but there's a whole new wave of movement-based 
mindfulness, mm-hmm. movement-based meditation that can be, and by the way, a, 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 an easy starter tool here is just take an immersive walk in nature without any device with you. So you're not listening to a podcast. Oh, well, listen to our podcast first and then <laughs> go for an immersive, <laughs> then go for an immersive walk in, in nature. Um, that can be very meditative. And then finally, bright light therapy. It turns out that exposure to natural sunlight or simulated sunlight with a light box actually is a drug that enhances dopamine based signaling just the way we want to with a stimulant. It's not as powerful typically as a stimulant, but has similar kinds of effects. So um, get outside uh, for a better inside. (laughs) Oh man, I love that. Well, Steve, I think that is as good a place as any to end. Um, Before we do, I do just kind of want to circle back to this idea of the superpower. Like I really want people listening who maybe have an official diagnosis or are maybe dancing around the diagnosis. Maybe they have kind of had a feeling for a while that this is not a doomsday fatal label that's going to ruin your life or prevent you from thriving or being successful or any of those things. I do think it's so interesting, this idea of the superpower. There's a a podcaster I love and I listened to quite a lot when I was starting my business called uh, Andy J. Miller. He also goes by Andy Pizza. And he has a great podcast called The Creative Pep Talk. And he's very open about his ADHD. He refers to it himself as a superpower. And he's gone on to have this incredible career, both in podcasting and as an illustrator. You know, he's done some of the most amazing work on the planet for like book companies and he's designed book covers and he's designed for the New York Times and blah, 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 blah. But he always says that, you know, in his industry where it's all about color, it's all about grabbing attention, ADHD gives him the ability to basically never be boring. As a podcast host, it forces him to constantly be coming up with something exciting and injecting energy like every few minutes. And that actually is really conducive to the medium of entertaining people getting people interested in what you're saying and keeping people's attention. So I think, you know, if we can find ways and find domains and find professions and even hobbies and things that we enjoy that naturally coincide with our natural strengths and superpowers, I just think it's it's a little hack, I think, that can really open up life for all of us, no matter where we find ourselves in the world of mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And and so really, I think if, if I were going to summarize it as a clinician, what I would say is ADHD comes with some liabilities and it comes with this potential superpower that we've talked about. So what we want to do, what we want to encourage everyone to do who is living this life is to say, all right, let's, as you said, let's lean into the superpower. Let's leverage it. Let's harness it. Let's find ways that you can build on your strength. And at the same time, let's be honest and have an honest conversation about the ways in which ADHD might be interfering. Let's take a good, honest look at things that we might be able to do to minimize that downside. We want to maximize the upside, minimize the downside. Mm -hmm. That might involve medication. That might involve psychotherapy. That might involve lots of different changes in lifestyle. It might involve adopting some of the tools, Hugh, that you talked about. But it's probably not just going to involve like, oh, I have a superpower, so I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to worry about the rest of it. It's like, no, you're going to really benefit from being honest about what some of the liabilities are, but not getting pulled down by it, not getting into that dark place. Because as you said, there really is an extraordinary upside that comes with it as well. Awesome. So look, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Really, really appreciate it. I know I can speak on behalf of Steve and just be fully confident that he would agree that we are absolutely loving making this podcast for you. It is a highlight of our week and we really, really want to keep doing it. So you can expect another 101 episode landing in your podcast app, whatever one that you use, where we'll be covering a completely different disorder with a completely different set of practices. And really, I think that these episodes, for me, even just selfishly, are a really useful way to learn more about the brain in a way that I find like kind of applicable and useful for everyday conversation with people that I love and I care about who have uh, a wide range of these different disorders. So yeah, we do have a Patreon if you would like to 
support the show and join with us on our mission of empowering people all around the world with quality Steve brings the quality I bring the banter I feel like no, quality, quality. Uh, research and mental health advice uh, you can support us and you can check us out on Patreon it's patreon.com forward slash mental health podcast there'll also be links to that uh, in the show notes and the website wait, as well wait wait can you say that? say that that's a great link I didn't even know that Hugh you got patreon.com slash mental health podcast all one word that'll take, take folks right to us or our website mentalhealth.fm also yeah. links to the Patreon. Is so right? mentalhealth.fm, you also get Patreon there. And the website is also where you can get the show notes for today's episode, all the studies Steve mentioned, links to anything else we talked about. I'll probably link the tools that I mentioned there as well. And the website is also the place where you can send us a message. We are really keen to do a Q&A episode over the next few months. And that depends on questions that we get from you guys. So you can either write to us or you can even submit a voice message as well. We've got a nifty little website widget that allows us to do that so we can hear some of your beautiful voices, hopefully featured in a future episode. Outstanding. Yeah. And and then finally, I would say we would love it if you appreciate the pod, if you could go on your Apple or Spotify, wherever, really whatever streaming service you're using to listen to the podcast, give us a rating and review. Um, be honest about it, but hopefully honest. Uh, in a good way. However, this this podcast has has struck you. We'd we'd love it if you could take the, just take a moment to to give us some feedback on it. Yeah, and it it helps us as well just to connect what we're doing here with the people that are actually it's it's being made for. You know, I always say to people like, you're just a like no offense, but like you're just a podcast metric on a dashboard until we know who you are, and it's so much sweeter and it's so much more beneficial if we can connect with who this who is actually listening. And to connect with what do you want to hear? What do you want us to talk about next? Because you know we make this show for you, and it really helps if it's a two way relationship rather than just a one way chat. You know, a- absolutely. Well, and the final thing about that is, if you just take a moment to give us a rating and review, it actually helps other people find the pod. Uh, so we, you know, we like to think that, that the content that we have could really be a benefit to to some folks that are that are really struggling. And so just a few moments of your time could, could really help potentially somebody halfway across the world. Awesome stuff. I think that is a wrap. Last thing I have to say, other than thank you so much for listening once again and sticking with us all the way through to the end. Also just want to say to you, Steve, um, thanks a bunch for your time today. And as always, really appreciated your insight and your good crack along the way, as we would say over here. Good crack. I have no idea what that means, but I'm going to take it in a good way. So thank you for that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a blast. It's been enlightening as always. It's been comedic because I love listening to you pronounce the word hour, as R, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know if it's like a Caribbean pirate thing or just the letter R, but, but it, 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 it made me smile every time. And then finally, I just want to thank everyone for, for listening and, um, have a safe and healthy week and I gotta say this because I, I don't know it's just ridiculous when I say it but but I this is how I sign off Hugh you ready peace out <laughs> I'm keeping that in <laughs> <laughs> awesome man.